this game has a little bit of historic importance in my career because it was the first game that I ever beat a master. I was playing against Ed Frumkin, a lifetime U.S. master. I was only 10 years old, and it was a pretty interesting game and a nice way to break through a barrier because it was an exciting way to do it. I was tra- I traveled to this tournament with my father, and um, we were a team traveling around the country to different tournaments here and there. And this was a very big thing because for a little boy to beat a master is a pretty big deal. So here we go. I played e4. He played the Sicilian defense. Now, I didn't know openings so well when I was younger. I knew them well enough, but I had mostly focused on the end game and the middle game. So my theoretical knowledge wasn't up to snuff necessarily, so the way I played the opening was a little strange. Knight f3, e6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, knight c6. This is a common Sicilian system. The main drawback to it is that he weakens the dark squares. You can see that his d6 squares are usually weak. And so the main line here is knight db5 for white. I'm threatening to play knight d6 check. Usually here, black will play d6. White will play bishop f4 attacking the pawn. Black will play e5. And now he's taken a light square weakness. White will play bishop g5. And this is called the pelican or Sveshnikov Sicilian, a very double-edged system which many strong grand masters have played for many years. The Sveshnikov can also be reached immediately if black plays the Sicilian with the four knights out, and then instead of e6, plays e5. White plays knight db5, d6, and then bishop g5. You can see the same position gets reached with one, mo- with one move less being made. But instead of this, I played bishop to e3, a move which is pretty bad when I look at it now. It was based upon not knowing the opening very well, and I was pretty much improvising. And my opponent played bishop b4, quickly took advantage of my mistake. Now we can see quickly his, th- his threat. Knight takes e4. The only defender is knight on c3, and now it's pinned. So I increased my defense. I increased my defense of the e4 point by playing f2 to f3, trying to make things solid. Now I'd like to quickly pl- bring out my light square bishop in castle kingside because the pin on my knight on c3 is very bothersome. But my opponent didn't give me time to do that. He's a, he's a good master and he, and he stopped it. He played very actively because I'd gone wrong. He played d7 to d5, hitting me in the center when my position is a little off kilter because my knight on c3 is pinned. He played correctly. So now already I was looking for a way to figure things out. I played the move bishop to b5. I pinned him in return. I'm trying to quickly develop and castle so as to cut the losses, so to speak. I have a threat now of knight takes c6, b takes c6, bishop takes c6. Check. If he blocks a check with bishop d7, I take his rook on a8. He has to do something about this. He played bishop d7. After he played bishop d7, I have two possible plans to choose from. One is that I can castle away, which is a temporary pawn sacrifice. I'm allowing him to play bishop takes c3, b takes c3, then d takes e4, f takes e4, knight takes e4. And here I could play queen f3. I'm attacking his f7 pawn and his knight on e4. If he defends them both but bring his knight back to f6, I can win a pawn by playing knight takes c6, b takes c6, bishop takes c6. I've won back the pawn and he hasn't castled. Castling was an option, but I think I played better. Bishop takes c6, b takes c6, e5. I close the center, and I have a knight well stationed on d4. Now his knight on f6 has to go somewhere. What should he do? g8 seems to be the only square, and that's what he played, knight g8. If he plays knight h5, what do you think of his piece out there? The knight on h5 is pretty bad. There's an expression, the knight on the rim is grim. And in fact, it's very true here. He has nowhere to go, so if he doesn't do something fast, he'll lose a piece. I played e5, and he retreated the knight to g8. His plan is to play knight to e7, and then to come to either g6 or f5 squares. I played a3, and here my opponent played bishop a5. This allowed me to take a bind in the dark squares, which I very happily did. After a3, bishop a5, I played b4, and now we see the idea. Dark square play. His bishop on d7 looks very silly. He played bishop c7. What is his threat? My e5 pawn. I defended. f4. He played knight e7. And now I try to occupy the c5 square with my knight. Knight a4. We can feel white's plan. All of my pieces, my bishop e3, knight d4, and knight c5, take advantage of his dark square weaknesses. His bishop on d7 has no role in this game. White's position is clearly better. My plan, occupy the dark squares, and then attack his king on the king's side.
He castled, and I brought my knight to c5. If he tries to prevent my knight from coming into c5 with bishop b6, I have a number of options. One is to simply castle away. Notice that if we trade, if we trade dark square bishops, it'll just limit his control even more of the dark squares. Later on, if I want to, I can move my queen to c3 and play knight c5. So I can take back with a piece. His bishop can always take on c5, but after I take back, he'll have a very bad piece on d7. Another option for me, when, if he plays bishop b6, is to play queen d3. What's the idea of this move? To maybe even move my knight on d4 back to b3 and put a bishop on c5. Then I can occupy the knight d4 square with my knight. If black tries to, to defend the c5 square with bishop b6, it can be a good defensive idea. But notice that I have three pieces that can control the c5 and d4 squares. And these days, he only has one. Maybe later his knight on e7 can defend the d4 square with knight f5. But it's a long way from c5. I'm going to inevitably control the dark c5 and d4 squares. He castled, and I came into c5. Now he challenged my queenside control, a5. I solidified it a bit. c3. Knight c8, he played. And here we see that he's honing in on a weakness of my position. He's not the only person with weaknesses. My light squares are bad. His plan is to play knight b6 to c4. This makes perfect sense. If he has dark square weaknesses, maybe I'm taking too much of my time controlling the dark squares and exposing light squares to him. This is often true in chess. Sometimes your strength can be your weaknesses. In this position, my knights are very solid in the dark squares, but I've left something open, and he's headed right for it. Good play by Black. I castled. He played knight b6. And now I began my kingside plan, queen g4. The point that I'm making is that I'm allowing him to have the c4 square. My play on the queen side is rather positional. It's consolidating. It's holding back his play. My real ideas lie on the king side. In the Sicilian defense, often when the center is closed, when the structure becomes closed, if black plays d6 to d5 and white plays e4 to e5, what results is white having a very clear plan of an attack on the king side and black's pieces being somewhat closed off from the defense. Notice now that the bishop on d7, bishop on c7, and knight on b6 are a long way from helping out the king on g8, and this tells later in the game. He played knight c4, attacking my bishop on e3. I played bishop f2. And now my opponent played queen to e8. The reason he played queen e8 is twofold. For one thing, He's responding to my threat. My idea is to play bishop h4, attacking his queen. When it moves, to quickly play bishop to f6, forcing g6. I'm threatening mate. He can't take my bishop because of the pin on the pawn. And then I maneuver my queen, queen g5 to h6, followed by queen g7 mate. A brutal attacking idea. So in fact, after queen g4, I have a very strong threat of bishop h4, followed by bishop f6. But also, queen e8 has an aggressive idea. The plan is to play f7 to f6, and bust open the center, making his two bishops more useful. I played rook f1 to e1, exposing another potential threat on the e6 pawn. If he plays f6, I can take it and then take on e6. Look at the variation. f6, e takes f6, rook takes f6, knight d takes e6. My, my knight is defended three times and attacked three times. He can't take it. Although it's pinned, it's solid enough. My position is very good. I'm up a pawn. My next move will be bishop d4 or bishop h4. If he can figure out a way to defend his mate threat, queen takes g7. White's winning here. So rook f1 to e1 prepared an attacking idea, which you'll see a little later, and at the same time defended against his threat of, f of f7 to f6. Bishop c8 is a move which doesn't seem to do all that much, really. For one thing, he's moving the bishop away from the potential threat of knight takes d7, but I'm not planning on doing that so quickly. His other idea is eventually to maneuver the bishop to the a6 f1 diagonal. If the bishop comes to a6, I'm not going to take it, obviously, and maybe he could do something later on. When a guy plays a move like bishop d7 to c8, you know you've done well. His plans are limited. There's, very not, there's really not much he can do. I play bishop h4. What is my threat? I want to utilize the idea of the pinned defender. Once again, bishop to f6. Threatening checkmate. The only way to defend it is g6, 
Then I would play queen g4 to g5, and then come into h6, followed by queen g7 mate. There would be no way to stop that plan, and black would be doomed. Bishop h4 is a loaded move. Black has to defend. He played king h8. A good move. Now notice, if I, notice that if I play bishop f6, he can just take it. The pawn would no longer be pinned. King h8 was a good prophylactic move. And now in this position, it turns out that black does have a plan. What he wants to play is a takes b4. If I take back with, the, with my c-pawn, then he'll win my a3 pawn, rook takes a3. If I take back with my a-pawn, he'll be able to trade off some material. Rook takes a1, rook takes a1, and then suddenly the e3 square is opened up to his knight, knight to e3. The position would still be good for white, but he'd be getting some pieces into the defense. I didn't want to allow that. I played a3 to a4. My idea is if he takes on b4, I'll take back with the c-pawn. When I played a4, I'm moving on the queen side, but in fact, my plan is to attack on the king side. I'm just holding the queen side for one more move. He played bishop b6 to try to trade off my knight on c5, which was fine with me. I played rook a d1. What's my idea? To attack with rook d3, followed by rook g3, trying to checkmate. He played bishop takes c5, thrilled to get rid of my, my solid knight, but of course he traded, he's traded off his only good bishop. I played b takes c5. And take a moment and look at the position. The quality of my pieces is clearly better. His bishop on c8 does absolutely nothing and is locked in by his own pawns. My plan is to play rook d1 to d3 and then rook over to g3. I was obviously thrilled about my position and I was lower rated than my opponent. And I was playing as a chess master. I was a 10-year-old boy. I was a pretty exciting position for me. And now he played knight b2. And the idea which I had been thinking about abstractly for a long time finally started to become closer and closer. To a reality. At this point in the game, I looked up around and tried to find my father, and I was disappointed to see that he was in the other side of the tournament room. Now, the reason I wanted to find my dad was because I was psyched because of the next move I was going to play. I had a long sacrificial attack. I played the move rook e1 to e3. At this point, I jumped up from the board while my opponent was trying to figure out why I just lost a rook, and I grabbed my dad and I told, I tugged him on the sleeve and I said, "Dad, come on and watch this." And he always got nervous when I sacrificed material in chess, and I loved to attack, and I loved to sacrifice. So I obviously had something up my sleeve. What do you think it was? Well, my dad stood and started watching the board, my opponent tried to figure out what I had in mind, and he took my rook on d1. Now, I want you to take a deep breath and look at the position. I just lost a rook. What was my idea? If I attack normally with rook g3, he has good defensive chances. He can defend with rook g8 not easy to see how to continue my attack, and I've just lost a rook. My idea was different. I sacrificed my queen from 8 and 6. Queen takes g7. Check. I remember looking up after I made this move and my dad's eyeballs were spinning back in his head. He couldn't believe it. What can black do? Only one move. King takes queen. Now we have to play this correctly. Try to calculate the mate in your head. When I played rook e3, I saw the mate here. At this point, I was very excited at the board. I knew I had my first master beat. There are two options. One is to play rook g3 check first. Let's look at that. If I play rook g3 check, if he plays king back to h8, bishop f6 is mate. That would work well. But rook g3 check is incorrect, because he can play king to h6. You should notice here that I only have a knight, a bishop, and a rook attacking. I'm down a rook and a queen. If I don't mate him fast, I'm in big trouble. After king h6, if I play bishop g5 check, he plays king to h5. Now what? If I play rook h3 check, he plays king back to g6. And after rook h6 check, he plays king to g7, and I have no more checks. I'm in big trouble. That didn't work. The move I had in mind was after he took my queen, bishop to f6 check. What are black's options? If king g8, you see mate in one, of course, rook g3 check. He can't do that. He has two possibilities, king g6 and king h6. It turns out that they lead to the same thing. He actually played king g6, and I played rook g3 check. If he had played king h6, I would play rook h3 check. And then after king g6, rook back to g3 check, and we'd have the same position we did in the game. His only move is king to h6. Calculate the mate. It's mate and three from here. It's always good when you have your opponent's king on the run. You want to bring him closer and closer into you, away from his defenses, and closer to your pawns, closer to the rest of your army. Bishop g7 check. 
forcing the king further up. He all, his only move is king h5. Mate in two from here. Rook g5 check. King h4 is the only move. Now we have to make the right move. We have a big attack going. You've lulled this king all the way up. Knight f3 checkmate. There's nowhere to run. The rook sacrifice led to the queen sacrifice, which led to a checkmate with a rook, knight, and bishop. He has almost all of his pieces left, but he's checkmated. His king is trapped in, on h4. It's all over. This was a nice way to win my first game against the master. Needless to say, when, he, when my dad saw the king running up, he felt that I had it all worked out. And after I played knight f3 check, my dad was ecstatic. He was, very, he was a very proud dad. His ten-year-old son just beat a master.